Hello, I'm Sheldon Axler, the author of Linear Algebra Done Right. This video discusses a section of the book titled Invertibility and Isomorphic Vector Spaces. Recall our standard notation. F denotes either the scalar field R of real numbers or the scalar field C of complex numbers. V and W denote vector spaces over the same field F. Suppose T is a linear map from V to W. We say that T is invertible if there exists a linear map S in the other direction from W to V, such that ST equals the identity map on V and TS equals the identity map on W. In other words, we are considering invertibility under the operation of multiplication of linear maps, which is the same as composition of linear maps. Continuing with our assumption that T is a linear map from V to W, we say that a linear map S from W to V is an inverse of T if ST equals I and TS equals I. Notice that these two I's are not the same. When we write ST equals I, we're thinking of I as the identity map on V, and when we write TS equals I, we're thinking of I as the identity map on W but it's convenient to use the same notation i for both identity maps. Note that in the definition above, we called s an inverse of t. Actually, the next result would allow us to call s the inverse of t, because an invertible linear map has a unique inverse. The proof is easy, and you can read it in the book. Suppose t is an invertible linear map from v to w. Now that we know that the inverse of t is unique, we can give it a notation. We use the obvious notation t raised to the negative 1 power, which is pronounced t inverse. In other words, t inverse is the unique linear map from w to v, such that t inverse t is the identity, and t times t inverse is the identity. Remember once again, these two uses of the symbol i to denote identity are different, the first one denotes the identity linear map from V to V. The second one is the identity linear map from W to W. Our next result states that a linear map is invertible if and only if it is injective and surjective. You might think that this is obvious and there's nothing to prove here, but that's not quite the case. If we think about functions under composition, it's clear that a function has an inverse in the sense of composition if and only if it's injective and surjective. But we're requiring the inverse of the linear map to be also a linear map. Thus, the content of this theorem is if we have a linear map and if it's injective and surjective, then the inverse in the function theory sense is actually linear. This is not hard to prove, but it does need to be proved. Please look at the proof in the book. We now introduce two new words into our linear algebra vocabulary. The first new word is isomorphism. An isomorphism is simply an invertible linear map. Our second new word is isomorphic. Two vector spaces are called isomorphic if there's an isomorphism from one vector space onto the other. In other words, if there's an invertible linear map from one vector space onto the other, then the two vector spaces are called isomorphic. Because isomorphism and invertible linear map mean the same thing, it's reasonable to ask why we introduce a new word when we already have a perfectly good word for thinking about a concept. We use the word isomorphism when we think of the invertible linear map as simply relabeling the elements of our vector space. The statement that the algebraic operations are the same after this relabeling is really just the statement that the invertible map is indeed linear. Let's look at a theorem that may explain what's going on here. This theorem states that two finite dimensional vector spaces over the same field F are isomorphic if and only if they have the same dimension. To see why this is true, first suppose V and W are both vector spaces over F of the same dimension. Let v1 up to vn be a basis of v, and w1 up to wn be a basis of w. Notice that each basis has length n. 
Now consider the linear map that takes the jth basis vector of v to the jth basis vector of w. This linear map is an isomorphism, and we can think of it as a way to relabel a typical vector in v, which is of the form summation aj vj, using vectors in w, namely summation aj wj. It's really great in mathematics when we can have one simple object, in this case the dimension, that tells us completely accurately whether or not two objects are isomorphic. This theorem tells us that a vector space over f of dimension n is isomorphic to fn. You might ask then, why bother with abstract vector spaces? Why don't we always look just at fn? The reason for this is that even if we are actually only interested in fn, sometimes the standard basis of fn is the wrong one to make things simple. In other words, we need to look at different bases other than the standard basis of fn, and then we're back in the situation, really, of an abstract vector space. For our next result, suppose that v1 up to vn is a basis of v, and w1 up to wm is a basis of w. If t is a linear map from v to w, then m of t, the matrix of t, is an m by n matrix, of course with respect to the two bases we just discussed. Thus m is a linear map from the vector space of linear maps from v to w into the vector space of m by n matrices. The content of our next theorem is that m is actually an isomorphism between these two vector spaces please be sure to read the proof in the book. The result above has a really nice corollary. Suppose v and w are finite dimensional. Then the dimension of the vector space of linear maps from v to w is equal to the dimension of v times the dimension of w. The proof follows immediately from the top theorem on this slide. Because L of v w is isomorphic to the vector space of m by n matrices, those two vector spaces have the same dimension. And of course, we know that the dimension of the vector space of m by n matrices is m times n. Previously, we defined the matrix of a linear map from v to w with respect to bases of v and w. Now we need to define the matrix of a vector in v. Thus, fix a vector u in v and a basis v1 up to vn of v. Because we have a basis, we can write our vector u as a unique linear combination of the basis vectors v1 up to vn. We take the coefficients in that linear combination and write them as an n by 1 matrix, as shown here. And that matrix is called the matrix of our vector u. Thus, the matrix of our vector u is a column vector, meaning an n by 1 matrix. Let's look at some examples. Suppose we work in F3, and we use the usual standard basis of F3. Consider the vector 5, 8, 2 in F3. This vector equals 5 times the first basis vector, plus 8 times the second basis vector, plus 2 times the third basis vector, where, of course, again, we are using the standard basis of F3. Thus, the matrix of this vector is the 3 by 1 matrix shown here. As another example, let's look at the vector space of polynomials with real coefficients and degree less than or equal to 2. We use the standard basis for that vector space, which is the basis 1, comma, x, comma, x squared. And let's consider the polynomial 3 minus 7x plus 5x squared. With respect to the standard basis for P2 of R, this polynomial is 3 times the first basis vector minus 7 times the second basis vector, plus 5 times the third basis vector. Thus, the matrix of this vector with respect to the standard basis is the 3 by 1 matrix shown here. Now we come to an important result. This result states that linear maps act like matrix multiplication. Specifically, suppose we have a linear map t from v to w and a vector u in v, 
we also have bases v1 up to vn of v and w1 up to wm of w. Then the matrix of the vector tu in w is equal to the matrix of t times the matrix of u. In other words, t acts just like matrix multiplication under the isomorphisms we have been discussing. In most of these videos, we will be focusing on linear maps rather than on matrices, because linear maps give a cleaner way to think about linear algebra. However, it's often useful to keep this theorem in mind because matrix multiplication is lurking behind the scenes as a possible interpretation. We have been discussing linear maps from a vector space V to another vector space W. However, the situation where we have a linear map from a vector space V into itself is so important that we give it a special name. Specifically, a linear map from a vector space to itself is called an operator. And we also simplify the notation in that case. Instead of writing L of V comma V, we usually write just L of V. Again, an operator means a linear map from a vector space into itself. Now we come to a remarkable and extremely important theorem. Recall that a linear map is invertible if it is both injective and surjective. So usually to check whether a map is invertible, both properties must be checked, injectivity and surjectivity. This theorem, however, says that if V is finite dimensional and T is a linear map from V to itself, then to check that T is invertible, we need to check only one of the two conditions. We can verify either that T is injective or that T is surjective, whichever is easiest. It is important to note that this theorem is not true without the hypothesis that V is finite dimensional. In other words, there exists operators on infinite dimensional vector spaces that are injective but not surjective, and there exist operators on infinite dimensional vector spaces that are surjective but not injective. This theorem, however, tells us that on finite dimensional vector spaces, everything works beautifully. Injectivity is equivalent to surjectivity for operators on finite dimensional vector spaces. Let's look at the idea of the proof of this remarkable theorem. The fundamental theorem of linear maps tells us that the dimension of V is equal to the dimension of the null space of T plus the dimension of the range of T. Thus, looking at the equation above, we see that the dimension of the null space of T is zero if and only if the dimension of the range of T is equal to the dimension of V. We can rewrite this last thing as follows. The dimension of the null space of T being zero, that's equivalent to T being injective. And the dimension of the range of T equaling the dimension of V, well, recall that the range of T is a subspace of V, and thus it equals V if and only if the dimension of the range of T is equal to the dimension of V. In other words, we see that T is surjective if and only if the dimension of the range of T is equal to the dimension of V. Our conclusion is that T is injective if and only if T is surjective. See the rest of the details in the book. This concludes the video on invertibility and isomorphic vector spaces.